Okay, we're down to the last one, 16th. Please join me in welcoming from Chicago, Illinois, Cuthbar Simpkin and his company is Viva Cell Bio. Cuthbar, come to the stage, please. This afternoon, I'd like to talk to you about a fluid that our company developed that will make the need for blood exceptional rather than the rule. During my time as a, um, as a trauma surgeon, there were too many patients that died because of the complications of blood and other fluids that we use to, um, to uh, stop blood loss and to treat blood loss. Um, this is what drove me. I spoke to many many uh, parents whose child I couldn't save. And this drove me to develop VBI-1, which is a phospholipid nanoparticle fluid that I designed for the treatment of severe blood loss. These are the scenarios in which this occurs, and these are our customers. The military is a, a big customer. Paradoxically though, the, the fluid that we give and blood that we give to raise the blood pressure has life-threatening complications. Blood and plasma can cause organ failure, and blood's very expensive. The head of starch colloids can cause renal failure, and for some unknown mechanism, by some unknown mechanism, they increase mortality. The FDA has issued a black box warning against its use. Albumin can cause organ failure, and crystalloids, such as Ringer's lactate, a standard solution, is just ineffective in severe, in severe shock. This is one of many experiments that we did in order to develop VBI-1. In this experiment, we re removed a large amount, a relatively large amount of blood from rats, and then we gave back fluids after keeping them in shock for one hour to raise the blood pressure. And now, let's come out here and, and, uh, and we go over the experiment. Uh, this is the result of giving blood back. The blood pressure comes back very nicely. This is our first solution that had a nanoparticle diameter of 300 nanometers. And here you see only a transient rise. When we reduced the size to 94 nanometers, we had um, an increase, as you can see over here, of, um, that was very nice and stayed up just like that of blood. But blood transmits disease. VBI1 does not transmit disease. Blood causes organ damage, and VBI1 protects the organs. Blood costs $6,000 per liter to process it to make it safe. And VBI1 doesn't require processing. It costs us $30 per liter to manufacture. The shelf life of blood is 42 days, and the shelf life of VBI1 is 12 months plus. Blood is not metabolizable, and VBI1 is metabolizable and can be an energy source. We have nine patents, nine U.S. patents, and 28 international patents, all issued. And in addition, we have five pipeline products for global markets. This is a, a financial project. I won't go through a projection. We won't go through all of this. It goes out to 2026. But after a phase 2A study, which we're on track to do in 2019 uh, here, we are expecting to have cash flow. And then by 2026, we'll be a billion dollar company. Why VBI1? All the current products have potentially lethal complications. We have an addressable market of over $13 billion. This is, not, this is a new paradigm. It is not a blood substitute. This is a fluid that is designed specifically for the pathophysiology of shock. It is unique. There's nothing else out there like it. All of the components in our product are known to be safe. Therefore, we are anticipating a, a, a rapid pathway through the FDA regulatory process, which will save time and money. We are on track to complete a phase 2A study by the third quarter of 2019, followed by a transaction that will be favorable to shareholders. We have traction. We've demonstrated this by our contacts with the military, with physicians. We have many physician uh, investors with the pharmaceutical industry and the Japanese external trade organization, which has special interests. Our team, each member of our team, has special connections and long-term connections with Buffalo. And we want to be here. We would love to be here. We, have a, we, we are looking towards a minimum of 25 jobs um, 
uh, to be created by 2022. We're impressed by the coordination with the lab between the laboratory and the hospital and other uh, aspects of the scientific establishment. We're impressed with the affordability of residing in Buffalo and we toured Athenix Pharmaceutical, which is a company that can make our product right here in Buffalo. This is our team. Uh, two members of our team have taken projects, Dr. Keith and Dr. Tulluri, they've taken projects from uh, the uh, preclinical phase all the way to market. Uh, Dr. Uh, DeShiel has got his PhD here at SUNY Buffalo and his JD here at SUNY Buffalo. And I've been a trauma surgeon for over 30 years. Thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity to present our project to you and the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bring my team out. Yeah, can you bring your team out? Yes, I can bring my team too. Okay, sure. I'm tired. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. This is Krishna Tulluri, Dr. Tulluri. Okay. She's our chief medical officer, and she's our regulatory, in house regulatory expert. This is our CEO, Dr. Stephen Keith. He has a long time experience in leadership positions with startups and other aspects of the finance world. This is Dr. PhD. Uh, he even Tarvin and Shield has a PhD in biochemistry, and he's an IP attorney for about ten, nine years. And uh, he got both of his degrees in law and in science here at SUNY Buffalo. Okay, you got your team here. Who's going to kick us off? Darren. Yep. Um, so really nice work. Question about after phase 2A, you have baked into the financial model an out license. Could you explain more about your plans for out licensing the technology, what it would be and who to and what for? Uh, at, the, at the completion of the phase 2A trial, the board of directors will then look to either spin out a subsidiary around VBI-1, do an out licensing. Uh, those are some of the considerations that we'll take into account what's best for shareholders. In terms of the out-licensing possibility, it would be to one of the major pharmaceutical companies uh, that are in the space that would be interested in intravenous fluids and already have uh, products in that area. We've already had discussions with a few of those uh, and, and really be looking to do uh, what is best for shareholder value. Okay, so but you're, you're, you're considering out-licensing the main product, is that right? VBI-1, correct. We do have a pipeline of other products that are based on the, the platform technology that VBI-1 represents, uh, but I mean, we are a small company, so we're not going to be carrying all the way to commercialization, marketing and sales, et cetera. Next question. Who wants to go here? Please, Martin. Um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about the guidance uh, that you've received from FDA uh, so far? You mentioned the, the possibility of an accelerated pathway, and have you had communication with them, and, and, and what have they said? I think I would like to begin that we already submitted the IND application, and they agreed with the plan, with the study protocol we presented, with phase 2A, and the only questions they had was a couple of them uh, regarding the manufacturing part of it. And if we fulfill those things, we'll go back to them again and uh, submit the you know, up updated application, then we'll be a go. So it's already been made, the communication has been established, and an IND has already been submitted. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about how much money has gone into the development of this so far? and what you'd be looking for to take it to the next level? Uh, to date, we have uh, already received about 1.3 million uh, in terms of a convertible note from friends and family. Uh, we anticipate a need for about 1.5 for our Series A1, which will cover the cost for non-GMP manufacturing, and also to, to do the testing on the material that's produced to answer the questions that the FDA has posed. Uh, and then we would be looking for an additional uh, 2.5 to 3 million uh, in that series, uh, that series A round to conduct the clinical trial. Darren, please. I'd like to hear more about the uh, the animal testing that was that's that's been done. How ma how many animals and are you looking to test in a, a larger mammal? Uh, a larger mammal is not necessary. We submitted these plus a large volume of data. Uh, to the FDA and they were fine with that. And the reason for that is the pathophysiology, the mechanism is very simple. We're changing the hydrophobicity of the plasma phase. And there's no new receptor that may be existing in one animal and not the other. Uh, there's no signal, new signal transduction pathway. 
this is a nitric oxide, a reversible nitric oxide uh, absorber. It's actually like a sponge. It's a mechanism very similar throughout the mammalian species. So they didn't have a problem with it, and that's why it's very transferable information. Typically, information about hemorrhagic shock goes from these animals, which we've done hundreds of them, to the to the to human 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 uh, trials. Please. I, I apologize if I missed this earlier, but can you just talk about the IP? So we we have uh, eight U.S. issued patents and about 28 patents in foreign jurisdictions. Those patents cover the scope of the patent claims cover compos matter, composition of matter, formulation patents, as well as method of use patents. Um, so essentially that's what uh, we have. All internally generated? Yes. Okay. Can, can I follow up on that? I, I took a quick look at the patents mm -hmm. and I saw Dr. Simpson that you were listed as the inventor and but there were you weren't licensing them from anybody so where were you when you were developing this I mean generally when I see these things they're affiliated with some organization I, right I, you want me to speak to that I can answer sure yeah so initially Doc Simpkins started some of the work at LSU and we did get a transfer of the work to, to, uh, to him. And then when we formed the company, the work was assigned to the uh, Viva Cell Bio. And since then, we've developed the, the, the other patents and what have you. So that's basically, Let me just all, all of the patents are owned and assigned to the company. All eight US patents and all 28 plus uh, patents in foreign jurisdictions, all owned by the company, assigned completely from Dr. Simpkins to over to the company. Mm -hmm. Clear up. Next question. That question? Um, so have you t talked to anybody about the potential of out licensing this? Have they wanted to know anything more about what's the mechanism of action from uh, 30, you know, from, from making the size of the particle one-tenth the size? Has anybody talked to you about that? We have talked to uh, a couple of multinational pharmaceutical companies, and we've not gotten into the depth of conversation about mechanism of action, uh, nor the impact of the cell of the, mi the size of the micelle. Uh, not yet. They do. They are really looking forward to seeing the, the results from the phase two A study uh, before we have those kinds of discussions. So far. And do you think that you might need to do any studies to determine what that mechanism of action is to improve the value of, the, improve the cost at which you could out license? Let me talk. I'll let the yeah. Yeah, you know, we we have some idea of what the mechanism is. We don't want to say all that we know, but we do know. I can tell you that uh, based upon studies we've done with mass spectroscopy, which I haven't shown here, it does reversibly uh, um, take up nitric oxide, which solves a conundrum that has existed in medicine for the last 40 years since nitric oxide was developed. If you block nitric oxide, all the vessels clamp down and you get no blood flow. So you have to have a way to reducing the bioavailability of nitric oxide and at the same time allow it to be produced. We've solved that problem. What we have here is like a sponge. It'll take up the nitric oxide, but it'll readily release it. And it has no effect on the actual production of nitric oxide. So this solves a 30-year conundrum. And it's, there's nothing, there, there is no other solution to the problem that has been reported. Please, Darren. Yep. So, so I know you, you're, this is not a blood replacement, but others are working on blood replacement technology. Could you, could you talk to that, to the potential competition? This is not a blood substitute at all. Yeah. This is a um, different paradigm. As a trauma surgeon, um, I'll try to make this brief, okay, but if, <laughs> as a trauma surgeon, I've operated on patients with Je Jehovah's Witness with, with hemoglobins of 2.8, and the normal hemoglobin is 12. Okay, and there are many experiments done by Pedro Cabrales, I won't go into all the experiments, that show that oxygen carrying capacity is not the critical, we have a lot of redundancy. The critical thing is viscosity, stroke volume index, 
nitric oxide. So this changes the axis. This flips the axis to something else. The nitric oxide in that mechanism that uh, leads to perfusion and, 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 and the metabolism of tissues. So this is another paradigm, and we have a platform based upon it. But if, if someone cracked the problem of, of a true blood replacement, it would obviate your solution? No, because blood, blood was not designed, blood was not designed to, for people who are dying. If I were to design a fluid, okay, I would not use blood. Blood has complement in it. Why would I put complement in it? Blood's complement. Why would I put neutrophils in blood? Why would I put cytokines? In, I wouldn't put that in there. Blood, I think, is designed for uh, euthanasia. When, we, when our species got very sick and we had very low technology, blood just let you go so you wouldn't be a, that's, that's my think teleological reasoning about it. This is designed for the pathophysiology of shock. So it's a different paradigm totally. And it works. Yep, thank you. We've got time for one more question. One, Lynn. one quick question. Will the 3 million Series A get you into humans? Oh, yes. I okay. mean, the Series 2A trial is in humans. And so we are talking about with 1.5 in the Series A1, and then the two and a half to three million in, in, uh, in, in A2 will be into our first clinical trial with the results at the end and very confident of positive results. How many patients does the FDA want you to test? Quickly. <laughs> Sorry. It's a very short study and a very small study. The proposed study actually uh, requires 20 patients to complete the study. And it's, uh, when I say short, because it, it starts from the, uh, a very controlled atmosphere where the people are getting the surgery, elective surgery, of hip replacement or knee replacement, where the blood loss is obvious. And in those circumstances, people usually store their own blood to give it to themselves at the time of the need. And this is the situation where we are going to be using it. So everything will be controlled. So based upon that principle, we designed that study. And FDA didn't have any questions regarding that. And based, I think it, it takes about a year to complete the study with everything together. And um, as they don't have any objections, we are pretty confident that we are going to be successful in that. Good place to end. Congratulations.